Hey guys, um, as I told you, I was going to be out today, but I wanted to make sure that I was able to introduce the um, Ghost of Rwanda documentary that you're going to be watching um, because you need a fair amount of background information for you to be able to understand what's going on in the documentary. So the reason that we're going to be talking about the Rwandan genocide uh, today is because PVA is extremely fortunate that Carl Wilkins is going to be visiting PVA for an after school lecture in a couple of weeks. Carl Wilkins was the only American that remained in Kigali in Rwanda during the genocide, but also because the genocide itself um, has roots in division of culture, uh, divisions of nationality and sovereignty, and international forces, what we call supranational forces. And if you're in my pre-AP class, third and fourth period, we'll be talking more about that when we get to Europe. But in its essence, the Rwandan genocide was a failure of humanity from the Rwandans themselves all the way up to um, the international community. The state of Texas has standards that apply to the Rwandan genocide and what we're going to be talking about, uh, 16C and 18B. 16C uh, explain ways various groups of people perceive the characteristics of their own and other cultures, places, and regions differently. So while you're watching, I want you to try and think about how each of these groups um, that were involved in the genocide, how they perceived each other, perhaps why they perceived each other this way. Um, and that goes back to nationality and um, culture as well. And then 18B is assess the causes, effects, and perceptions of conflicts between groups of people, including modern genocides and terrorism. These texts were written in 2010. And the idea to include modern genocide um, was brought up by several uh, academics as being important, uh, especially with the Rwandan genocide, which happens in 1994. So in order for us to understand the documentary and uh, to try and comprehend what's going on um, in the genocide, we got to start with Rwanda's place and its history. Um, and it's complicated, but here's Rwanda. You see this little uh, small country. Um, it is in the Great Rift Valley in Africa. It's known as the land of a thousand hills, um, mountains, uh, really lush um, valleys. Um, it looks beautiful from the pictures. Um, but unfortunately, unfortunately, like all of Africa, uh, Rwanda was colonized by the Europeans. And you probably remember colonialism and colonies, you know, going back to the 13 colonies, but also, um, you know, God, gold and glory that you learned in seventh grade. So Europe, starting in the 1800s and a little bit earlier uh, with the South Africans, had started colonizing Africa. They were taking control of these places in Africa and claiming them for their own. Obviously, um, Africans had been there. Uh, that's where the uh, birthplace of humanity is. Um, but the white Europeans came in and start carving up Africa and it's called the race for Africa. Uh, initially, Rwanda is held by the Germans, but you see it's right on the border of the Belgian colonial holdings and the German colonial holdings. Eventually, um, after um, the Berlin Conference in 1884. Eventually, Germany cedes Rwanda to Belgium, and Belgium begins to control it as one of their colonial holdings. Um, the Belgians controlled this area called the Congo, the Belgian Congo, and the Belgians themselves were known for being brutal, brutal colonial leaders. Um, the Belgians used terror and violence to scare um, the Africans into doing what the Belgians needed them to do, which was basically uh, getting raw materials to take back to Europe. If you don't know anything about Belgium, it is a small country north of France. They speak French. So during the documentary, you're going to be hearing some Rwandans speak and they are speaking French. So way back when, um, the people of Rwanda, uh, historically, we know, um, were the Tutsi and the Hutu. They still exist. Um, they are, form the two main groups in Rwanda. There's also a very, very small minority, around only 1% of people in Rwanda called the Twa. And the Twa were probably the first people there. They are um, a group of cave dwellers, uh, pygmies, um, which exist all over um, Central Africa. And it's really interesting to read about them. But eventually we have the Tutsis and the Hutus. 
So the Tutsis are the minority, but they had been the royalty of Rwanda for centuries. They were the kings and the kingdom of Rwanda was the Tutsis. So when the Europeans come in, it makes sense for the Europeans to give the Tutsis preferential treatment because the Tutsis are already the leaders of Rwanda. And so the Belgians want to make friends with them so that they can um, use the Tutsi to help control the rest of the population. So the Tutsis were the minority, but they were given special treatment. They had access to education. They had access to the Belgians themselves, better jobs, etc. The majority of people in Rwanda were the Hutu. Um, they were given a lower social standing um, to the Tutsis during the colonial period. But the really interesting thing about uh, the Rwandan people is that culturally the Tutsi and the Hutu are indistinguishable. They look the same, they dress the same, they eat the same foods, they practice the same religion, they intermarried. Um, you know, it was not a big deal for a Hutu and a Tutsi to marry uh, and have children. In most instances, the only way to tell them apart was their identity cards. And during the colonial period, all Rwandans began having to carry identity cards. The Belgian uh, colonial powers made them. Uh, and on these identity cards, the Belgians decided to list their nationality. Were they Hutu? Were they Tutsi? Were they Twa? Or were they naturalized uh, citizens? This uh, idea of carrying these identity cards with those nationalities on them um, carries past the, the colonial holdings into Rwandan independence and they were still forced to carry them. Uh, it's interesting to note that now in Rwanda that the identity cards don't have those nationalities anymore after the genocide. So we're going to go back and start in the 1940s and talk about the various civil wars in Rwanda. It's complicated, so bear with me. In the 1940s, um, the Hutu, remember the majority, but they don't have power. The Hutu start to form a resistance, um, a counter elite. And the Tutsis recognize this. The Tutsi leadership starts to worry that they're losing control. So they start to uh, advocate for independence from Belgium. Other African areas at the time were starting to get rid of their colonial powers because, quite frankly, the Europeans were too busy dealing with what happened after World War II. So the Tutsis are trying to gain independence. Belgians are not ready to give up um, Rwanda and the Belgian Congo. So the Belgians actually begin to back the Hutus. Now remember, they hadn't originally. Originally, it was the Tutsis the Belgians were friendly with. So they begin to back the Hutus and they start to replace the Tutsis in positions of power with Hutus. And the Hutus begin this propaganda campaign against the Tutsi. Um, and they start attacking the Tutsi and, you know, telling the other Hutus that Tutsi were oppressors and they had been in charge and they hadn't treated the Hutus well. Um, and it gets so bad that a lot of Tutsis start to flee Rwanda and they go into the neighboring countries of Burundi and um, Uganda Eventually, the Hutus themselves gain independence in 62 from Belgium, uh, and they begin to form their own government, and they are in control of Rwanda. But at the time, the Tutsis are starting to organize a resistance to move back into Rwanda because they were not being treated very well in the neighboring countries that they had fled to. So when this happens, um, the RPF forms, and the RPF is the Rwandan Patriotic Front. The Tutsis, mainly the refugees, start to advance back into Rwanda in the 1990s. And war breaks out between the RPF and the Hutu Rwandan government. The Belgians and the French um, start to see things falling apart. And so they begin to back the Hutu government because uh, they wanted to ensure um, stability. There was a lot of uh, coffee um, that was produced in Rwanda and they knew that uh, having a like all out civil war in Rwanda was going to be bad for them. So the Belgians and the French are backing the Hutu government against the Tutsi, the RPF. At this point, the United Nations enters the scene. And it's important for you to understand who the United Nations are. Um, that's also a requirement of the course. The United Nations was created in 1945 as an international organization dedicated to maintaining peace around the world. Um, it followed along the heels of the League of Nations, but basically it was created right after World War II because the world did not want another World War II. The United Nations has had mixed results. Some people think it has done a lot of good in the world. Um, they're uh, one of the big organizations dealing with the like refugee crisis in Syria and Turkey. Um, 
which the pre-AP classes, high third and fourth period, you talked about at the beginning of the year, um, the UNHCR, the High Commission on Refugees. But um, some people think the UN is not effective, um, that it doesn't work. Um, It certainly has had mixed results. And everybody would agree that Rwanda is universally considered one of the UN's greatest failures. The problem with the UN is sovereignty. Countries choose to belong to the UN, um, and but the UN is a coalition of governments. And the UN itself cannot force any of its members, its sovereign member states to act. So they can suggest and they can ask, but when it comes down to it, it's up to the individual countries as to whether they're gonna send troops or, or whatever. So before we start with the Rwandan genocide, we have to understand um, about what was happening in another part of Africa at about the same time. So here is Somalia. It is a country uh, up here on the Horn of Africa. Um, Some events occur in 1993 um, that involve the United Nations and the United States. Um, If you have seen the movie Black Hawk Down, uh, this is about the um, events that occur in Mogadishu in Somalia. So basically, Somalia had been dealing with a civil war for several years uh, until 1993, where they still were. Um, And because of this uh, and drought, um, the Somalis were starving. Over a million Somalis uh, were dying, literally dying of starvation. And it was considered a major humanitarian crisis and the United Nations steps in as it's supposed to. And it starts sending aid, uh, humanitarian aid to Somalia, mainly food, medical supplies, that sort of thing. But after a couple months, the United Nations recognizes um, that that food is not getting to the Somalis and the Red Cross is reporting to the UN and saying it's it's not getting here. We don't know what's going on. So the UN's, UN starts to investigate and they find out that the relief aid was being stolen by Somali warlords who were then trading it for weapons to continue their fight um, against the other Somalis as a civil war. So the UN decides that they have to do something and they have to go in and protect those food sources so it's actually getting to the people who need it in Somalia. So the United Nations starts to st- send troops to do this. Um, the US goes in um, as part of the the, orga- you know, the peacekeeping organization and um, things are starting to fracture and it gets bad enough in Mogadishu that the UN decides it needs to take out its humanitarian workers and some of um, you know its doctors and people that are there with the UN. So they start an evacuation of Mogadishu. Um, the United States is sending helicopters in. Uh, they're trying to get people out, which they are having some success with. But at the same time, the decision is made that they're going to try and stop this civil war, or s- definitely stop this organization um, from stealing food and so they just the decision is made that they're going to go arrest the lead man of this of these extremist forces in uh, Mogadishu he's hiding out in a house and like a compound and the U.S. takes charge of this mission and the U.S. decides to send some of its elite forces so they send um, some specialized rangers the Delta Force if you've heard of them and also some Navy SEALs in their goal is to arrest this guy. Well, long story short, the mission is a complete and utter failure. Uh, everything falls apart. There was miscommunication on the, the with the helicopters, which are called Black Hawks. That's why the movie's called Black Hawk Down. Um, and some of the the troops that were supposed to come in um, on arm, in armored vehicles. And overnight and the next day, intense fighting is happening in Mogadishu, and 18 American soldiers die. This happens in 1993, and this was the largest loss of military life for Americans since the Vietnam War. So this is a whole generation of people that hadn't, were not experienced with American soldiers dying. And America flips out. They're, why are we here? Like, they're talking about a, a place of the world that Americans didn't even know existed. Like, very few Americans knew where Somalia was. Why are our soldiers there? Like, they can't even help themselves, and now we're going in there, and they died. So this is weighing heavily on the psyche of America um, and President Clinton, who's president at the time. 
Um, they were shocked at what was happening. And I just want you to be aware of the timeline. So October 1993, um, this is my freshman first semester in college, by the way. Uh, October 1993 uh, is Mogadishu in Somalia. And then April 1994 is the beginning of the Rwandan genocide. So I want you to recognize how close that is. Um, the two countries are, like I said, close, but completely, completely different. So uh, Miss Miles is going to start the documentary. Um, it's intense. I've been warning you there is a significant amount of really graphic violence. Um, it's hard for me to watch. There's places I've seen it a couple times and I still have to kind of turn my head in some places. If you need to leave the classroom for a bit, you have permission to excuse yourself. Uh, you just need to stay out by the door and give yourself a, a few minutes break and, and then come back in when you're ready. Don't wander around. Also, as you're watching, I want you to be keeping a list of 10 questions that you have for me. You're going to turn these in so that I know that you were paying attention. And I also want you to list five things that were really shocking to you. And those that's going to be a daily grade. Um, but you need to be doing it on paper. And all of your computers need to be closed. So you're paying attention. Um, watch out for your classmates. If you see someone that's really upset, you know, make sure that you're suggesting that they leave the room or whatever. Um, but we'll talk about it when I get back more in detail. You're not going to finish it today. We'll finish it um, next week. Um, so just be thinking uh, about those original questions I have, like how do people identify themselves and what are some conflicts that arise when people consider themselves different from other people. So um, have a good weekend. You're going to be really sad after you leave today, but try and have a good weekend anyway, and I will see you guys next week.